we are in a series called Life Hacks, and a life hack is an, any action that solves a problem or simplifies a task or reduces frustration in your everyday life. And uh, the book of Proverbs is God's Life Hacks manual. This little book, it's a little strange compared to other books of the Bible, perhaps, but it contains practical, useful tips for everyday life. It is the greatest how-to book ever written. The Hebrew word for proverb means a comparison because these short statements are meant to teach us how to choose between bad and good options or sometimes, which is a little tricky, between good and best options. Proverbs are not written in paragraphs. They are concise statements of truth. And one of my favorite descriptors, somebody said a proverb is a short sentence based on long experience. It's critical to understand because of the unique way this book of your Bible was compiled by King Solomon, it's very critical to understand that Proverbs are not promises. They are probabilities. They are the likelihood of a situation. Proverbs focus on the expected result not the exception to the rule. Proverbs tell us what should happen, not everything that could happen in life. That's Proverbs. They are not promises. They are probabilities. Proverbs isn't about assuming that God will always satisfy our human notions of fairness. No, Proverbs is about something greater and higher. Proverbs is about submitting ourselves to God's standards of righteousness because Proverbs puts wisdom in the context of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not about dread. It is about deference. It's about deferring and respecting and honoring and submitting to the will of God. You see, wisdom in Proverbs is presented to us as a healthy sense of reverence for God, as a sense of recognition of my own place in God's universe. Wisdom in Proverbs is a moral mindset. It recognizes that I am not God, and so I don't really know what's best for me, and I don't get to make up my own definitions of what is right and what is wrong like so many in the world are trying to do right at this moment. Rather, Proverbs teaches us that we need to submit to the word and we need to trust God with the outcomes, whatever they may be. So tonight, we're going to hit some of the highlights of the first section of Proverbs that we talked about last week, chapters 1 to 9. And I want to say at the outset tonight, Proverbs is not a guarantee that everything will work out in your favor. Would to God that it was, but it's not. It doesn't guarantee that everything will work out in your favor, but Proverbs is an assurance that all things will work together for your good. We see that concept in both the Old and the New Testament. Proverbs 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord, that's just the beginning of wisdom. It's the opening gate. It's the starting point. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. You see, Proverbs doesn't guarantee that everything will work out the way you want it to. It guarantees that if you put God first, it'll work out the way God wants it to. And that's far more important for your life, believe it or not. In the New Testament, Paul jumps in and he says this scripture that everybody has on a fridge magnet, magnet but almost nobody believes because if they really believed it, they, 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 they wouldn't complain like they do against the Lord. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We know that. Because we are the children of God, we are not promised that all things will be good, that all things will feel good, that all things will seem good. In fact, we live life long enough and we'll find there are good days and sad days, hard days, bad days. There are all kinds of days in a lifetime. 
But we know something as children of God. That if we will put God first, all things, good things, bad things, hard things, sad things, will work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Yes, the principles of Proverbs, they will improve your life. But that's not the important part of Proverbs. The perspective of Proverbs, putting God first, submitting to the wisdom of the Lord, the perspective of Proverbs, it won't just improve your life, it will impact your heart. And your heart is very important. Proverbs chapter 4 and 5 and then verse 13, they say, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth, Take hold of instruction, let her not go, keep her, for she is thy life. Everyone say wisdom. Everyone say understanding. Everyone say instruction. Now these aren't rock solid, iron clad definitions, but in this context, wisdom here refers to discretion. It's, it's, it's stepping back and allowing God to step in. Discretion here is the, the desire to embrace God's perspective, to, to understand that I don't have it all figured out and I don't always know what's best for me, but if I'm wise, I'll embrace God's perspective. Understanding here refers to discernment. Discernment goes one step further. This is the sense that I apply God's principles in my life. I may not even understand them, but I have discernment that I trust his understanding when I can't lean on my own understanding. And so I apply God's principles to my life. If you're a new believer at CCC, you don't have to understand everything we do to start doing what we do. You can worship before you understand what in the world was that. You you can come to the altar and pray before you even know how to pray well. In fact, any prayer is a good prayer. Any prayer sincerely prayed to Jesus, he loves that prayer. He doesn't need your best English. He doesn't need your your best professional uh, uh, presentation. He just needs a sincere heart. So, and, And in every other area of your life, you may not understand why God commands certain moral things in the Bible, but if you will do them, obeying the command, applying God's principle will bless your life. And then thirdly, instruction here, it refers to discipline. And that's the word that nobody likes. But discipline is really the willingness to accept God's boundaries in our lives. God says no, so we don't go there. God says yes, so we make every attempt. God says that's dangerous, so we put distance between us and that. And we trust God. Here's why. Because we embrace his wisdom, which is his perspective on living. Now, Proverbs continually refers to the way or the path or the road that people walk. The Hebrew word, of course, means a road or a path or a journey, but it's something deeper than that. It refers to a sense of direction. If I could say it this way, you're walking in a certain direction tonight, every person in the room. You're either walking toward God or you're walking away from God. You're either walking toward your purpose and fulfillment or you're walking away from your purpose into frustration. So this deeper sense of direction is really the image that Proverbs wants us to get about the way. It can be a way of righteousness. It can be a way of sin. Now, people announce their good intentions to serve Jesus all the time. It happens in this church. It happens in every other kind of church. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. But here's what they forget. It is not their good intentions that matter. It is their daily direction. It is their daily footsteps and choices that ultimately determine where they will end up. You may have heard the expression, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And I could add very clearly to that, you show me your footsteps and I can show you your future. Daily discretion and daily discernment and daily discipline really do matter. 
I don't know if you've ever heard the old saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Here's another modern version of that concept that I think adds a little bit of clarity. Your direction, not your intention, determines your destination. You can intend to do good. You can intend to make better choices. You can intend to serve Jesus, but it's not your intention that's going to matter in the end. It's the direction you set every day. True discipleship is not about what you say or even about what you want. True discipleship is about what you do. We say wonderful things about people. We really do. We try to be kind. And, and once in a while when somebody makes a mistake or, or, you know, we'll say about them, well, they have a good heart. And maybe you've said that. Well, they have a good heart. He has a good heart. She has a good heart. You just lied. Because nobody has a good heart. In fact, Jeremiah the prophet said, the heart is deceitful above all things. And it is desperately wicked, this human heart. Who can know it? But then, here's the hope. The next verse. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. Watch this. Even to give every man according to his ways. There's that word from Proverbs. And according to the fruit of his doings. Not his intention. Not his wishes. But according to what he does. Jesus is watching what you're doing To every one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, he said when he evaluated them, I know thy works. So it's not what you want or what you desire or what you hope. It's not your good intentions that matter. It's what are you doing today? What way are you walking today? And no book is better at addressing the the fine points of how we're walking than the book of Proverbs. Chapter 4 and verse 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I have to be careful here because I could lock down and lock up right here. One translation says, Guard your heart because it affects everything you do. Guard your heart. And there's so much in the world, so much corruption and pollution that tries to get in our heart. It tries to affect the way you think about yourself. It tries to affect the way you think about others and friendships and relationships and everything from money to possessions to sexuality to everything else. There's so much pollution and corruption in the world. And the devil has targeted targeted it like a laser beam on your heart. Because if he can get your heart he can get you. If he can get your heart, he can get your future. So the writer of Proverbs, an Old Testament writer, he didn't have the Holy Ghost. He wasn't baptized in Jesus' name. He wasn't on this side of the Bible in the New Testament, but he was wise enough to say, hey you folks, guard your heart because out of your heart come all the issues of life. And so there's a lot about temptation in that first section of Proverbs especially contained in the father-son speeches. There's about 10 of those. And, and it's especially concerning sexual temptation because temptation is very treacherous. Proverbs 6 says these words. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can somebody walk on hot coals and his feet not be burned? And then in verse 32, the warning right out there in our faces Whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He thinks he understands what he's doing in that sexual sin. He thinks he understands and he thinks he's in control, but he lacks understanding. Because he that doeth it, he's not just playing with his passions. He's destroying his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get. And his reproach shall not be wiped away. What's Solomon saying? He's saying sexual sin is so hurtful and harmful, it's like being burned by fire. Sexual sin addicts the body and the mind, but it also destroys the soul. 
Sexual sin brings wounds and dishonor and reproach to your life. And so what that means is not that it can't be forgiven. It's just that years later, you're still dealing with the carnage and the shrapnel of bad decisions in your life. So I will say this very clearly because Proverbs says it very clearly. The time to fight temptation is before you face temptation. You don't wait till you get in the moment all alone with the devil attacking, with, with uh, your, your internet uh, browser open, and, and, and you wait until you're all alone and you know you've got a weak spot and, and you're there and the devil's there and nobody else is there. You don't wait till then to decide you're going to fight temptation. You fight temptation before you face temptation. You make good decisions now that put boundaries and perimeters and fences around your life so that when you get in the hour of temptation, you've already made a decision and you can get out of it without damaging your very soul. And that is why, brothers and sisters, and I'll say this often in this series, you need the Word of God woven into the fabric of your life. You need the Word of God carved somewhere into the structure of your days. Here's why. You need God's Word ringing in your ears when temptation is calling your number. Temptation is flattering. It's like the strange woman of Proverbs 7. It flirts with our ego and it tells us exactly what we want to hear and it pulls at our insecurities and it speaks to the desires of our flesh and it inflames our carnal passions and temptation offers the false fulfillment of forbidden fantasies. Temptation is deceitful and deadly. So if you want to overcome, you have to be determined and you have to be disciplined in order to push it back. People say, well, I'm an exception. I just, I have worse problems. I have worse. No, you don't. Flesh is flesh is flesh is flesh. There is nobody. Now, you may meet some people that think they're far beyond temptation. It only takes one bad call, one bad decision, one bad day, and they're flat on their face. There's nobody in here. And I'm looking at some precious elders that have been serving Jesus longer than I've been alive. And I wouldn't want to insult them or offend them for the world, but there's nobody in here old enough to be beyond the reach of temptation in a weak moment because flesh is flesh is flesh is flesh. But if you will resist the devil, the Bible promises that he will flee from you. The devil is a coward. He tries to get you all alone and pounce. That's why he doesn't attack you when you're in the middle of a church service with some lustful temptation. He's scared to death. We'd all get around and pray him out of here. He's a coward, but he tries to get you alone when you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're tired. He tries to get you all alone and hurt you because temptation can destroy your heart and your soul. But if you will get a little Holy Ghost backbone in you and say, I am tired of fumbling the ball and falling on my face in the same place every time, and if you'll stand your ground and push him back, he will flee. Well, how many times do I have to do that? See, that's the problem. You have to do it every day. You can't do it like it's not a set it and forget it. It's not once and done. Every day you live, if you're going to matter for God's kingdom, if you're going to be victorious in the Holy Ghost, you've got to push him back every single day. And here's the problem. Everything in contemporary culture and everything in many church cultures today tells us that temptation isn't a big deal anymore. After all, many churches would tell you you can yield, you can succumb, you can play, you can enjoy, and then you just repent. It's the get out of jail free card. Just repent. Please hear me. That is one of the devil's biggest deceptions because he knows that every time you yield to temptation, it puts your spiritual life in reverse. 
He knows that every time you yield to temptation, you now have to reconquer all the territory you just lost and you have to refight all the battles you had already won. So the devil loves to whisper in your ear, you can do it and you can just repent later. You can enjoy it and you can just repent later. He is playing you for a fool. James strongly warns us about the process of temptation that ends in death. Now we often concentrate only on eternal death. So as long as we haven't died yet and we repented and we feel God's presence and we think we got back to God, we think we've ex escaped any consequences if we repent in time to be restored. But here's what we forget. Sin, by definition, always brings death. It always kills it always steals. It always destroys. We forget this, that every time we sin, something in us dies. And we have to repeatedly repent in order to see our spiritual life resurrected. And there are some people, it's so sad. It's just this hamster wheel of sin and repent and sin and repent and sin and repent and sin and repent, sin and cry, sin and come to the altar, sin and repent. And it just goes on and on and around and around for years. And if you're here tonight, I address you in the Holy Ghost and I say, what a waste of your time, what a waste of your potential, what a waste of your life, what a waste of God's power that resides in you. You are better than that. You are stronger than that. In the name of Jesus, you need to get up out of that and you need to push the devil back. Because the rules don't change just because you got a weak spot. James said every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And here, you can't break this rule. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's not talking about eternal death someday in hell. That's talking about every time we sin, it kills something in us. And we have the conversations as pastors. I can't feel God's presence anymore. And it's not because God isn't there. It's because they've deadened their sensitivity to the presence of God by consistent, continual sin. And then they get scared and they get worried. Can I plead with you tonight? Before you ever get near that place, you need to forsake sin and embrace Jesus fully, completely, totally. And here's the key. And daily. You can't do this once a week. You can't do this Wednesday night, Friday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. You've got to do this every day because the devil is fighting you every day. He's trying to hurt you every day. He's trying to kill you every day. The time to face temptation is before you face temptation. There's lots of other verses and I won't belabor the point. Proverbs 8 and 12 says, I wisdom dwell with prudence. Prudence means discretion or caution or moderation or restraint. You see, wise people, they do something that other people don't do. They, they put boundaries and fences and restraints in their life. They, they, they don't try. See, sin seeks secrecy. Sin wants to get you alone because then you're defenseless and helpless and sin can pick you off. wise people. They have prudence. They have discretion. They have restraint. And they put boundaries around their life. They make sure that when they're weak, they've got somebody with them. They make sure that they're talking to Jesus every day about their weak spots and their struggles. They have prudence. And then somewhere along in chapter 8, and I'm not going to be long tonight. I'm almost finished, in fact. Somewhere along chapter 8, we read this beautiful poem about wisdom, and it, it's a personification of wisdom. Wisdom is a, a lady in Proverbs. And wisdom herself, she tells us something so important and beautiful and powerful. When God gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, 
When he appointed the foundations of the earth, when he set everything in order and in place, wisdom says, then I was by God, I was as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Proverbs just told us something beautiful. Wisdom is older than creation because wisdom was in the mind of God before creation. God didn't want you to live your life foolishly. He wanted you to live your life wisely. He created wisdom before he created this planet. Wisdom was present when God set the boundaries of the world. The boundaries, the mountains go here, the sea goes here, the ocean goes here, here but no further. God set the boundaries. God made fences and walls and gates and doors and laws and commandments in creation. And they bring God's favor when we keep them. In eternity past, Proverbs tells us that wisdom was God's daily delight. And so wisdom should be your daily pursuit. Wisdom says about herself. Again, it's a personification of wisdom. Whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me, against wisdom, wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. If you embrace God's wisdom, you find life. But if you reject God's wisdom, you're actually choosing death because your choice to live in contradiction to his word does incredible damage to your heart and your soul. Kathy, if you'd come back. The first section of Proverbs is written mostly in paragraphs. It's all kinds of um, wonderful stories and parallels and pictures. We read about conversations between a father and son, and we we read uh, the poems of Lady Wisdom. So the first section of Proverbs is written mostly in paragraphs, but The second section, beginning at chapter 10, is the section that most of us are familiar with. It's the section we'll be talking about next week and beyond. It's Solomon's collection of Proverbs. And these are the one-liners of wisdom. They are knowledge in a nutshell. They're, They're like condensed common sense. They're pictures that are so worth pondering. And when we get into that section, and some of you, you've read through Proverbs many times... The book of Proverbs can feel very random sometimes. It kind of feels like you're floating in an ocean and you're just kind of swirling around all these different random statements coming at you. They're just bits of wisdom that come at us rapid fire. They don't seem to have any apparent plan or pattern. Proverbs seems aimless, even accidental. Proverbs feels like we're drifting in that ocean of wisdom but without a specific purpose or design. Some studies, some scholars, some theologians, they've they've attempted to gather the Proverbs into little groups. You know, over here we've got all the Proverbs about money and all the Proverbs about family and all the Proverbs about parenting and all the Proverbs about intimacy and, and, and they try to do all of that. And that can be very valuable. And we'll actually do a little bit of that as we move forward in the next three weeks. But I have to say, we are not better book editors than the Almighty. He put Proverbs in the order that he put it in through the pen of Solomon for a reason. So what is really going on in this random, seemingly accidental, rapid-fire Wisdom from every direction, book of Proverbs. What's really going on? Maybe we should ask ourselves why God presents the Proverbs in such a random order. And maybe if we do ask ourselves that question, we'll realize something. Life comes at us every day in random order. You don't get to neatly package your marriage and family issues and deal with all of them, have your coffee, enter your day, and then efficiently move on 
to your work and money concerns and then come home and after you've had a nice profitable day at work, now methodically tackle your conversation and your morality issues. Life isn't that neatly packaged. Life isn't that structured. Life comes at us with the same controlled chaos that Proverbs comes at us with. It's the same kind of controlled chaos that Proverbs uses to teach us God's wisdom. A money principle over here and a family principle here and marriage wisdom here and parenting wisdom over this direction. Life comes at us that way. Thankfully, thankfully, God speaks to us in the ordinary moments of life. God speaks to us in the big messes that we make of our lives. God speaks to us in the little kindnesses and memories and miracles of our everyday lives. He does it just like Proverbs does it. It feels random. But if you can pull back the veil when you're a child of God, it's not random. We trust an unseen hand. We trust an unseen God, but a God who is very, very real. And just like Proverbs comes at you, slamming from every direction all these random things, and life happens that way. Sometimes you just feel like you get on your feet from the last crisis and a new one hits. You just feel like you put this issue to bed and a new issue crops up its head over here. That's life. That's Proverbs. But behind it all, for those of us who are children of God, for those of us who have put wisdom first, God's wisdom, not ours, <laughs> all things work together for good. Last verse, Proverbs 9 and 11. Before we leave the last chapter of the first section of the book of Proverbs, one final statement from wisdom. For by me, by wisdom, thy days shall be multiplied and the years of thy life shall be increased. And I know, I know. You say, wait, wait. Pastor Raymond, sometimes we live according to the principles of Proverbs and it doesn't work out. Sometimes we save money and Proverbs says if we'll be frugal and we'll save our money, we'll have enough to provide. And I did that and I don't. Proverbs says if we're a sluggard, if we're slothful, if we're lazy, if we sleep all day, it won't work. We won't have anything. But Pastor Raymond, I know people that they just seem to be blessed for some non-apparent, unbelievable reason. And here I am struggling, and yet I'm the one serving God. Pastor Raymond, Proverbs says, train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they won't depart from it. And I've got a broken heart because I've got a broken family, and I've got a backslider in my life. That's when you got to remember, Proverbs are not promises. They are probabilities. They tell us the expected result if you live rightly, but they don't give us every exception. And that I know that's frustrating because we want a guarantee, but there's no guarantee with something as random and unpredictable as life. But in the middle of the raging sea of life, throwing us up and down and back and forth, there's an anchor, the writer of Hebrews says, that holds us and enters within that which is within the veil. It's an anchor that holds you to the promises of God. And so when Proverbs 9 and 11 says, by wisdom your days will be multiplied and the years of your life shall be increased, we can look at that and say, well, yeah, I know people that have lived wisely and godly and righteously and they didn't live long lives. But you're forgetting something. Life isn't measured in minutes. 
life is measured in moments. There are people whose moments on this planet have a far greater, far more eternal impact than somebody who lives many, many, many more minutes than they did. In fact, as a pastor, I've officiated at many funerals over 40 years, and I would tell you this, nobody, nobody ever counts down the minutes and says, well, they only got this many minutes. Every time we talk about the moments that were so precious, the moments that impacted us, the moments. And so wisdom says, if you'll follow me and if you'll give your life to God, your moments will be multiplied. The years of your life will matter. They'll be increased. You'll have more moments. We had a moment here tonight in the presence of God as the wonderful team led us in singing and the Holy Ghost moved into this moment, into this sanctuary, into our lives. Don't ever pass a moment by when God is in that moment. Wisdom makes your days more meaningful and wisdom makes your years more fruitful. With all you're getting, get wisdom, get understanding, get Jesus with all you're getting. That's it for tonight. I hope something in here ministered to you. I would love it, and Jesus would more than me, if you'd lift up your hands and your voice because that beautiful presence of God is still residing and resounding and abounding in this sanctuary. He can heal your heart. He can give your heart strength to overcome temptation. He can give your heart healing to overcome brokenness. He's he's here by the power of His Spirit. He is here in this moment. I know life seems unfair, but our God is just. I know life seems random, but God behind the scenes is a master weaver and He holds the thread of the tapestry of your life. You are not living as a victim in this life. You are a victor in this life because of Jesus. I wish you'd stand to your feet like a standing ovation of praise. Let your hands keep going. Let your voice keep going and give Jesus worship in this room. Give Jesus worship in this room. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I worship you, God. I worship you, God.